Hi, and welcome to this run-through lesson uh, on the second paper of your mock exam. Now, once again, uh, I'm recording this as a video so that you can um, kind of go at your the pace that is appropriate for you. Um, you can review questions uh, if you want to hear my explanation again, um, uh, and you can get the most out of this process because going through papers and really understanding how you could have improved is the most powerful thing that you can do at this point in your kind of biology journey to improve your grades. So uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is actually going to show you the mark scheme for the um, uh, for the multiple choice part. So you can kind of see if you did go wrong, where did you go wrong? Uh, and then you can focus on the questions which you didn't get right uh, and understand how you get the right answer. So pause this, have a look. If you understand where you went wrong, then um, then you can kind of just fast forward through that question. But if you're not sure at all, then listen to how we kind of get to that point. Okay, so pause here if you want to. And now we're going to go through the, the multiple choice questions at the beginning of the paper. Let's get into it. <clears throat> all right. Uh, let's do this. All right, okay, so which of the following human diseases A to Z is caused by a fungus? Uh, this one is just a recall question, really, so hopefully this wasn't problematic. It's A, athlete's foot. Um, if you weren't sure about that, athlete's foot and ringworm are caused by fungus. Influenza, that's virus. Malaria is a protozoa or protist, and tuberculosis is a bacteria. Okay, number two, um, the answer here, this is again a recall question. The answer is D, uh, is a tomato late blight. Now, I confess I had to look this up. I got this wrong because uh, I always struggle to remember these plant diseases. So I'm going to drop in a little picture here from your textbook. Here are the plant diseases that you need to know. You need to know them, and you need to know what causes them. These are just something you have to memorize. So if you didn't get that right, make a note of this and memorize this little table here. Let's move on to number three. Which of the following statements, A to D, is not true of human erythrocytes? The first thing you might have gone wrong here, erythrocyte is a red blood cell. You need to know that RBC, red blood cell, carries oxygen around the body. They are produced from stem cells. Yes, they are. They are produced from stem cells in the bone marrow. So, okay, B is also true. Those are called hemopoietic stem cells. They are specialized cells. Yes, they are specialized cells. Now, they do not undergo mitosis by process elimination. We've got that. It must be this one. But the reason is they don't have a nucleus. They can't divide any further um, so they have to be produced from stem cells. They can't make more of themselves because they don't have a nucleus. Moving on. <clears throat> Speaking of red blood cells, here is a bunch of them. So um, question four and five are about this blood smear. So perhaps we should look at the blood smear. I'll zoom in a bit and sort of try and figure out what everything is. Uh, it would be a useful place to start. Well, A is a red blood, site, red blood cell or erythrocyte. Pretty circular there. Now, E is a weird, wormy looking thing. So uh, we'll leave that for a moment, but something weird, which we maybe haven't met before, comes up later. Um, B, hmm, B is a bit difficult to tell. It's a small chunk of something. Could well be, could be a platelet, probably. Now, D and C, <clears throat> uh, D looks to be a macrophage, I would say. Or a monocyte or a macrophage because it's got a large kidney shaped nucleus. Whereas C, I think I can see a multi lobed nucleus there. There's a lobe there, the lobe there, lobe there. So um, that one is going to be a, a um, neutrophil. Now, immediately, I see I've made a mistake, but that's fine because I can kind of figure it out. So, which is a lymphocyte? Well, I haven't written lymphocyte anywhere on there. Now, the best one is going to be D, and D is a lymphocyte, because lymphocytes have a nucleus that is large and takes up most of the volume of the cell. So D is the best choice, and that is the right answer, um, even though initially I thought that was maybe a macrophage cause, or a monocyte because they're similar looking. Five, the cell shows a parasite called trypanosoma, which of the following statements is um, evidence that it's a eukaryote? So E is a trypanosome. It's like a parasitic kind of um, protista. Um, so eukaryote, <clears throat> nucleus is present. That is definitely 
uh, a good one. It is similar size to blood cells. That's another good one because prokaryotes are much smaller. They would probably be, you know, an order, an order of magnitude, 10 times smaller, even 100 times smaller. Presence of flagella would not be uh, good evidence that it's a eukaryote. So uh, five would be uh, one and two uh, only. B. Moving on. Six. Plants can produce a variety of chemicals in response to pathogens. Which of the following is produced by plants in response to pathogens? Okay, well, it's A. So plants don't have an immune system like humans. Uh, they basically do chemical warfare. So they can produce things that are antibacterial compounds. They don't have antibodies because they don't have B cells. Uh, an opsonin is a type of um, type of antibody, really. And penicillin is produced from a fungus. So penicillin is, is also not, not one. So six is A. Moving on. Eight. Polar bears, Ursus maritimus, the sort of sea bear, if you like, and giant pandas, whatever that is, uh, both belong to the family Ursidae, which is the following A to D is not true about the classification of polar bears and giant pandas. Okay, well, we've got stuff about class, species, orders, and phylums. So immediately, I know I have to remember my kind of list of the, the way things are classified. So it's uh, did King Philip come over from Great Spain? or king domain, king prawn curry, or fat Greek, greasy sausages, whatever mnemonic device you want to remember. So um, now they, hmm. So they belong to the same family, which is Ursidae. So I'm kind of making a note of what the question tells me. Um, what about the rest of the things? Okay, if they belong to the same family, then they would also, they belong to the same domain, the same kingdom, the same phylum, class and the same order they'd belong to all of the same ones because the order would i think would be probably mammalia i guess um or carniv carnivori but yeah they you can know this is true they each belong to the same order carnivori that's true carnivores they each belong to the same phylum chordates yeah that means they've got a backbone basically uh they each belong to different species yes that's 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 true they each belong to a different class. Ah, there we go. That's the untrue one. A is untrue because they do belong to the same class. If they're in the same family, they must belong to the same everything above. Uh, and that's how it works. Tricky one, that one. Moving on. <clears throat> Nine. Which of the following statements is or are evidence that DNA replication is semi-conservative? Okay, so remember, semi-conservative is you have things like that. Mm. Da, 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 da. And then it splits, and we have one old strand, and it's changed color, kind of one new strand, like that. That's what semi-conservative means. Semi-conservative. All right, so which one is evidence? After one replication, the number of adenine nucleotides is equal to the number of guanine nucleotides. That is not evidence. That that is like a nonsense statement, really. But that just depends on the DNA. Um, just depends on the DNA you're copying. Copying. Um, yeah. All right. After two replications, two DNA molecules have one original. Oh my God! After two replications, two DNA molecules have one original and one new strand, and two DNA molecules have two new strands. Yes, that is true. My God, that's horrendous. Here's how, okay? After two replications, this is replication one, but what would happen if you replicate that again? Well, you'd have, it would look like this, okay? These are all, these are the strands that you have um, from, from these, then you add in the new strands. In my little color code here, the blues are the new and the red is the old, okay? So it would look like this, okay? So yeah, two DNA molecules have one new and one old, and two DNA molecules have two new strands. That's what this says. That is a horrendous, horrible question. Right, three. After, oh my God. After three replications, there are eight DNA molecules. That's true. 
only two of which have strands from the original DNA. That again is true because this one would split and only one of them would have the red, and only one of them would have the red, and then be eight things like that. Oh my God, that's so horrendous. What a horrible, horrible question. 9C is the answer. This paper's tough. 10. Which of the following reactions, A to D, describes the conversion of a polymer to a monomer? Polymer to monomer, so breaking something down into a smaller molecule. This is building, so this is not, this is not a hydrolysis. Insulin into amino acids. That is, oh, hang on a minute. I almost, I almost went wrong here. That's a very important thing. If you got wrong here, what you did is you just saw insulin to amino acids, yes, but this is not the correct phrase here. That would be hydrolysis. So this bit is wrong. Even though that bit's right, this bit's wrong. So B is not true. Maltose into glucose. Um, well, that's like a, I wouldn't really call maltose a polymer. I mean, because it's, it's two, it's a disaccharide. I wouldn't call that a polymer. It's a disaccharide. So for that reason, no. Starch is a polymer. Going into glucose is a monomer and is hydrolysis. So the answer is D. Okay, so 10, D. Exam technique point there. Don't jump to conclusions. I almost jumped to a conclusion. If I'd been rushing, I might have gone, yeah, B, insulin to amino acids, that's the one, tick it, move on. Check, okay? Check, they're not gonna trick you because they're always gonna try and trick you. It, they're really horrible. They will try and trick you and you must not let them. 11, which of the following, A to D, is true of a competitive enzyme inhibitor? Competitive. Okay, so I'm immediately when I think of competitive, I've got this like kind of graph in my head. I don't even know if it's about that, but that's what I just think of. When I think of competitive, I think of this image. Competitive binds to a site other than the active site. No, that's non-competitive. Changes the shape of the active site. No, it doesn't really do that. That's non-competitive. Disrupts the tertiary structure of the enzyme. No, it doesn't do that. Effects can be overcome by adding more substrate. Yeah, that's what I was talking about here. Okay, so this is... Um, this is with inhibitor, and this is the substrate down here. If you add enough substrate, you move further enough along this x-axis, you outcompete the inhibitor. So just, you know, they always ask questions about this graph, basically, you just got to know this graph for competitive inhibitors. So the answer is D. 12. Which of the following, A to D, is not true about adult stem cells? So adult stem cells come in many different varieties, many different flavors, one of which is the stem cells that make blood. So they are found in the bone marrow. The ones that make blood are found in the bone marrow. They are not specialized. That is true. They're not specialized. They are totipotent. Let's put a question mark on that one. They can be used as a renewing source of undifferentiated cells. Yes. So this is, this is really a question about this word. So potent means powerful. Toti means all. Okay, so totipotent means all powerful. Totipotent means that it can become any type of cell. <laughs> the lights have just gone out in my classroom. Any type of cell I got to get up and move around. Ah, so it really comes down to the meaning of this word totipotent. Now totipotent means potent is power. Toti is all, so all powerful. So if a cell is totipotent, it can become any type of cell that there is, any type. So in terms of um, potency, we've got totipotent is only really embryonic stem cells. And then um, you've got multipotent, which is what adult stem cells are. Some adult stem cells can become many different types, but not all. So um, bone marrow stem cells are multipotent because they can differentiate into red blood cells, white blood cells, and I think muscle cells as well, I think. Um, and then below that would be unipotent stem cells. So for example, there are stem cells underneath the surface of your skin that can only regenerate the skin because you lose loads of skin every day, like thousands of cells are coming off my hands as I'm doing this. So that would be unipotent. And then I guess you just have cells that can't divide at all, which I guess would be impotent, maybe? I'm not sure. Um, so the answer, is C. <clears throat>
All right, now let's get into the longer answer questions. Now, the really most important thing you need to do for these long answer questions is think, um, did you understand what the question meant? Uh, when we went over the last paper, I noticed that a lot of people um, were kind of not quite understanding what the question was wanting you to demonstrate, because it's all about a question is wanting you to demonstrate a certain bit of knowledge or a bit of skill. So what is the question asking you to demonstrate? Um, and how can you demonstrate it and say it clearly using the correct vocabulary. Okay, so when we go through this long answer questions, all the time I want you to be focusing on those ideas. Okay, let's get going. So first of all, uh, let's read the question. So it says, mitosis and meiosis, both of them, uh, are important uh, in the life cycles of organisms. And then it goes on about hydra. So hydra is a small animal that lives in uh, fresh water. And it says here, when environmental conditions are favorable, uh, Hydra reproduces asexually. Large numbers of offspring can, can be produced in this way. Okay, so that's all inf information that we might need in a minute. And then it has a little picture of this asexual reproduction, which is kind of a bit like yeast budding, um, or maybe almost like a plant reproducing asexually. So then the question is, name the stages of mitosis in the correct order. Now this is tricky because mitosis um, is actually specifically the division of the nucleus, okay? Division of nucleus. Now that can be um, easily kind of got wrong because you might have included some other stages. So you might have just remembered interphase, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, but actually interphase is not part of mitosis. Interphase is when um, the cell is copying its DNA, so interphase is not one, it should just be prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, okay, um, for the two marks. I'll show you the mark scheme in a minute, we can sort of look at how, if you might have got one mark and, and why. Then the question asks, suggests why Hydra reproduces asexually when conditions are favourable. Um, so when conditions are favourable, everything's going well, um, Asexual reproduction is fast, uh, and also um, you produce exact copies of the parent hydra. So that means that the, the parent hydra was doing well in the favorable conditions. You don't want to risk changing anything. Um, if conditions are favorable, you just want to make more uh, copies of the hydra that can do well in those conditions. So um, conditions are favorable, you can guarantee that the daughter hydra, or the baby hydras, will also be able to thrive in that environment, okay? So those are the ideas. Let's go to the mark scheme to look at the exact wording uh, that you need for those first two uh, bits. And here we are, okay? So for that first question, you needed to say prophase, then metaphase, then anaphase, then telophase for the two marks. And if you had mentioned interphase, or in fact cytokinesis, you would have dropped down to one because interphase is not mitosis, and actually cytokinesis is not mitosis, it is the division of the cell body, not the cell nucleus. Um, then for the second question about um, asexual reproduction, you get a mark for saying that the offspring will be genetically identical, and then something uh, for saying that offspring are produced rapidly uh, in large numbers. So there, and then this, you could have gone a bit further and said that the offspring, because they're identical, will also find the conditions favorable that the kind of parent hydra found favorable, okay? Right, uh, let's get back to the next question, which is a little bit more complex, and it's a six marker. So then it says, when conditions are not favorable, hydra reproduces sexually, okay? So sexually when it's not favorable. This often happens in winter. Cells in the body will produce sperm and eggs by meiosis. Large numbers of sperms are released into the water. Large numbers of sperms are released into the water. These sperms can fertilize eggs from different individuals. Each egg forms a tough outer coat and can lie dormant at the bottom of the water until conditions improve. Okay, there's loads of information there which we may need to, do, uh, to use. All right, then it says, explain how sexual reproduction in Hydra leads to genetic variation in the offspring. And this is a six marker here. Now, often we say that in six markers, they want us to do multiple things. Uh, and it's actually a bit tricky here to really kind of think of all the things that we want to um, get from this question. First of all, 
um, there's going to be a part on explaining how sexual reproduction leads to genetic variation. And the second thing that you might have missed in this question is the question wants you to also be specific and mention Hydra, okay? So how does sexual reproduction lead to variation? And then specifically talk about Hydra. So let's plan and then um, I'll show you the, the mark scheme. So variation in meiosis. There are three major reasons for variation. Number one is independent assortment of chromosomes. And that takes place during uh, metaphase one. Metaphase one, and we're talking about maternal chromosomes and paternal chromosomes being separated. And it depends on the number of combinations that are possible, depends on the number of chromosomes. So um, the number of combinations you could, if you wanted to go a bit mathsy here, it's two to the power n, where n is the number of chromosomes. So in a human, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, so it's two to the 23 different combinations are possible. I'm not sure how many chromosomes Hydra have. All right, so that's first cause of variation. Number two is um, crossing over. an exchange of genetic material, and this is between non-sister chromatids and this happens actually at prophase one and um, you need to just sort of talk about the chiasma which is the crossing over and the recombination, you could have used that word, recombination uh, to produce different chromatids. And then three, once you've got a crossing over, you can have, I'll just write IA for independent assortment of chromatids. Okay, the chromatids assort independently and that's at metaphase two. And then specifically with Hydra, that's the other thing we need to talk about. We also have other sources of variation, which are large numbers of sperm produced, which we got from the question. So there's millions potentially of sperm and hundreds of thousands of different eggs, which means that we can get even more combinations between all the sperms and all the eggs. Large number of sperm, large uh, number of eggs, uh, and then random fertilization. And this leads to many different um, kind of baby hydras, many, 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 many thousands of different baby hydras. And you might add another thing as well, if we go back to the question there, I don't know if it's relevant, but it's worth giving it a go, that maybe that these, um, that these, uh, it says actually the eggs can lie dormant. So I sup hmm, I wonder if that is, I don't know if that's after fertilization or before, but you may be worth giving it a go. You could just say that then maybe the embryos can lie dormant at the bottom of the pond until spring when it gets warmer, because it does say that this happens generally in winter. Um, so potentially fertilization happens in winter and then the embryos actually really only start growing in spring. I'm not sure, but it's worth a go. Okay, so those are the things that you could have said. Um, and notice how I didn't just describe the process of meiosis, which I think maybe some of you might have done. I talked specifically specifically about the sources of variation. Let's have a look at the mark scheme now. Um, here it is, okay? So, first of all, let's look at a level one or two response. Sorry, level one response for one or two marks. And it says, this is hard, look, mentions more than one reason why sexual reproduction leads to genetic variation. So to even get one or two marks, you have to talk about at least two of those things, like independent assortment and random fertilization, for example. To get level th uh, two, three or four marks, you have to explain in some detail how sexual reproduction leads to genetic variation with reference to more than one stage of meiosis. So you basically have to talk about, um, you know, independent assortment of chromosomes and crossing over. And pretty much this is the highest anyone got in this question because to get um, level three or five or six, you had to give specific reference to Hydra. 
um, and talk about more than one stage of meiosis. So you had to really talk about um, Hydra itself. Okay, all the points that you could have said are on the right. So, uh, and there's lots of things that I missed out as well. So first of all, sort of actually you could have got marks for just saying that variation is about alleles, different alleles, random fertilization, I didn't say that. Um, unique gametes, I didn't say that. Well, I might have done if I'd written it out. Um, crossing over, prophase one. Alleles swapped between non-sister chromatids. Then independent assortment or random segregation in metaphase one. Also relevant in metaphase two if crossing over has occurred. So I talked about independent assortment of chromosomes and then independent assortment of chromatids later on. And then we have the kind of specific um, linking to hydra in this bottom section here. So the fact that we've got lots of sperm from one hydra can fertilize an egg. Um, two hydra can have different alleles, so we can have um, different combinations coming together. Sperm carried in the water. I didn't talk about this. The sperm might travel a large distance down a stream, for example, to unrelated hydra further away. I didn't talk about that. Um, so that is pretty much the mark scheme. Pause there and have a look at your answer. Figure out why you got the mark you did and how you could have got more. Okay, let's look at this little one marker down here now. Suggest why sexual reproduction in hydra occurs in the winter. Well, it said that asexual reproduction typically happens in the summer when conditions are favorable. And then we also know that in the winter, conditions are less likely to be favorable. So, so that's kind of what we need to get at. Um, so we could say something about unfavorable conditions, which might mean if there's asexual reproduction, no organisms would survive because they're all genetically identical. So you want to create variation to give you a good chance of some hydra surviving um, with the right alleles. Um, so that's the idea you need to get across. There's a couple of different ways you could have said that. The mark scheme credits these few things. So here we are. Um, some offspring might survive unfavorable conditions um, or you know, have useful alleles, or you could have gone the other way and said, if it was, if it was asexual reproduction, all offspring might die because they're all the same. So uh, you have to have one of these three uh, points. Okay, moving on to the next question, which was uh, beastly, okay? It was an awful question. So awful, in fact, that I even took a picture of it and sent it around to all my biology teacher pals uh, for us to discuss because it was so horrible. Right, anyway, uh, C, mosses are small plants that live in damp conditions. Uh, this, this is lots of new information, so you have to apply your knowledge. The life cycle of many mosses involves two stages. We've got this gametophyte stage and this sporophyte stage. Now it says here, this is key, uh, the gametophyte contains haploid cells and produces sperms and eggs. So the gametophyte is haploid, as well as the sperm and egg are all haploid. So I'm going to annotate on the diagram now. So N meaning haploid. So N would, is haploid and 2N is diploid. The sporophyte contains diploid cells. Let's change color. Sporophyte contains diploid cells and produces spores. So where's the sporophyte? Here it is. Um, so that's got to be diploid and produces spores, which can be spread easily through, through the air. Uh, so this is diploid. So we know that this is 2N. And this has got to be 2N because it's produced from fertilization. So that's got to be 2N. The zygote grows into the sporophyte by mitosis. Okay, so that's 2N to 2N. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's mitosis. So it's asking, what's the question? I haven't got to question it. The zygote grows into the sporophyte by mitosis. The haploid gametophyte of one species of Funaria contains 28 chromosomes. Okay, so let's annotate again, change color. Haploid, so this has got 28 chromosomes. A single DNA molecule contains two strands. Okay, I'm going to draw that like this. Yeah, two strand DNA molecule. Calculate the number of DNA strands present in the nucleus of the zygote immediately before mitosis. Right, now this is super horrible for one mark. I can't believe it's one mark. Let me just take you through it. Okay, so. We've got 28 chromosomes in the gametophyte. That means, that's N, remember, 
So that means how many chromosomes in the zygote? 28 times 2, which is 56, okay? 56 chromosomes. Okay, great, 56 chromosomes in the zygote. So is it 56 DNA strands? No, it's not. So it's 56. Now in each chromosome, each chromosome, how does a chromosome look if it's before mitosis? Let's do this point first. Before mitosis, the chromosomes look like X's, don't they? Because they've always been they've already been replicated at interface. So that means you've got to do each branch of the chromosome. So 56 times 2 for the DNA strand thing, times 2 for the fact that each chromosome is an X. Um, is that it? Was there another one? 56 times 2. Yeah, that's, I think that's right. 56 times 2 times 2. So that is uh, 112, 224. Yeah, 224. Is that right? I think it is. Let me double check the marks game. Yeah, 224. Okay, so if you didn't follow my working, here it is. They've act, this, I've never seen this on the mark scheme. They've actually had to kind of explain how you get the answer here for the markers because it's such a baffling question. Okay, so there we go. Um, and then the next question, you can see the answer down here. The next question is, where does mitosis, ha sorry, meiosis happen? So it, you could have put it, uh, you had to just mark as an X. So you could have put it here because we don't really know. It has to be either here or here, okay? Somewhere between here or here, uh, because we've, we're going from a sporophyte 2N to a gametophyte N, so meiosis must happen here, because meiosis is the reduction division, which means it reduces the number of chromosomes by half. Super horrible question. This one a bit easier. A diagram of a moss sperm is shown in this figure. Uh, it's got a nucleus, kind of spirally shape, and it's got two flagella. The flagella allow the sperm to move toward an egg, similar to a human sperm tail. Suggest and explain, suggest and explain another adaptation that is likely to be present in the sperm cells. Suggest and explain. So there's two marks available. One's going to be for suggest, and one's going to be for explain, isn't it? So you just have to apply your knowledge of human sperm cells. We can't talk about the tail, we've already had the tail, but potentially there might be some sort of acrosome here. And the that would be the suggest, and the explain is to have, contain digestive enzymes in order to digest its way in through the outer layer of the egg. Or we could have said something like many mitochondria, that's the suggest, and then the explain would be uh, to provide lots of ATP to power the movement of the flagella, something like that. Let's look at the mark scheme. Uh, there it is. So either many mitochondria or enzymes or acrosome. Uh, and notice you've got to have the, the statement, that's the first mark, and then the explanation. Or you could have said the statement and the explanation. You can't get two marks for just saying many mitochondria acrosome. You have to say it and then explain it. Let's keep cracking. All right, <clears throat> 21. Algae are photosynthetic organisms that live in the water. A rapid increase in the population of algae is known as an algal bloom. Scientists study the population of algae in a river in the UK at different times of year, and here are their results. So first thing, whenever you're looking at a graph is just understand what's going on. Before you even really get to the questions, you just have a look at it, try and think what's going on. So here we've got the algal population. It's basically going up in the summer, in the late summer and then coming down. And here we've got the months. So what are our months? We start in March, so springtime. We go through summer, and then the graph finishes in November, so sort of at the beginning of winter. So it's not a full year there. It's part of the year. Uh, and the other thing is that it's not a smooth curve, is it? It doesn't go all the way up and then down. There's a lot of up and downness to that, which might be relevant later on. Okay, first question is a little bit of maths. It says calculate the percentage decrease in the population of algae between the peak population and the 1st of November. Between the peak population. Okay, where's the peak? Peak population is there. Now, we've got to be really accurate 
just peering at the screen here, it's going to be about there. You, in an exam, should use a ruler to go across and really make sure that you know exactly where that is. So that's uh, 210, 20, 30, 40, 50. So I would say that this is 215,000, I would say, there. And on the 1st of November, it is pretty much bang on 20,000. I mean, you could make an argument for, for it's like 19,000 or something, but I think, I think that will get it. So what is the decrease? <clears throat> First of all, we have to calculate the so percentage change. You've got to remember this. So important. Percentage change is equal to the change divided by the figure that you start at times 100 to make a percent. Okay, so what's the change? It's, I'm just going to, I'm going to get rid of the 1,000. So it's 215 minus 20. Um, and then it's going to be uh, over 215. I've just done a little mathematical shorthand there. I've got rid of the 1,000 because it's all going to cancel out because we'll have thousands on the top and thousands on the bottom. So if we do that calculation, I'm going to get my calculator out. Uh, dun, 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 dun. We get the answer. 215 minus 20 equals divided by 215 equals times 100 equals. I've got a 91% decrease. What's the mark scheme say? Yeah. So if uh, if answer is 91 plus or what plus or minus one, or 90.7 plus or minus one or two marks. So it says max one if answer not given to two or three significant figures. So 91 is okay, 91.7, sorry, 90.7 is okay, but if you'd written down what your calculator said, 90.69, then that's not okay, because actually that's, um, that's an inappropriate number of significant figures. It's too much detail, too much precision, um, which is not sort of real. <clears throat> okay, so that's two marks, that question. Right, the next one, the river in which the study was conducted is described as a dynamic ecosystem. And this is a bit weird. I've never really heard this phrase used before. Sometimes they throw in questions that are really just about your understanding of language. So really, you're just, they're asking you, what does dynamic mean? And dynamic means not stationary, changing, in flux. So that's what you needed to go with. Um, and you have, it says use figure 2.21.1 to explain why it could be described as dynamic. So this is the, where you get the extra mark. So maybe one mark for sort of saying dynamic implies change. And then using figure 21.1, you could sort of talk about that change. You know, say that the algal population, you know, goes from almost zero up to 215,000 is fluctuating, that sort of thing. Mark scheme. It's relatively simple idea of change over time and then the second thing remember is to use the figure and it says figures with units oh i wouldn't have got that okay i would have I've, i would have forgotten to do that um with units that's tough i bet you know even if i've marked your paper i might have given you some marks because i'm not sure if i spotted that when i marked it so that means to get the mark gosh sometimes i think biology papers are really pedantic um you've got to give this okay you have to have if you talk about the figures you have to say the population goes from roughly zero up to 215,000 cells per centimeter cubed you have to get the unit super picky okay so now on to this part three uh, and i've just copied the the graph picture to the right so we can kind of talk about the graph whilst we're looking at the question at the same time so the question says a student concluded that the increase in population of algae was due to higher temperatures and higher light intensity in the summer months okay there's the conclusion i'll highlight that in green the increase in population of algae was due to higher temperatures and higher light intensity in the summer months remember what i said about student conclusions whenever you see the phrase a student concluded typically there's a little bit of truth in it, but it's not great. So considering this figure as the data source, discuss the weaknesses in the conclusion. So actually, this one is not evaluate. We're not really looking for any positives. Um, there is maybe a little bit of a positive in that the population is high in August, and it's generally warm in August. But there's a lot of weaknesses. So first of all, let's look at the weaknesses. 
uh, light, oh, light intensity, sorry. First of all, we don't have um, any data on light intensity here. There is no data on light intensity, so we don't really know. And so that's one thing. And second of all, when is the highest light intensity? Well, the highest light intensity would be at the summer solstice, which would be about June the 21st, which is around this point right here. So it doesn't look like the highest population would be at the time when there is uh, the highest light intensity or, in fact, the highest temperature, because the highest population is actually um, sort of in late August, uh, and the population in September is, is, fairly, is fairly high. Um, another thing is that there is a lot of fluctuation. There's a lot of up and down, isn't there? So, for example, the population drops in July quite a large amount from about 150,000 down to about, what's that, 70,000. There's a large drop in July. So what's going on there? It can't just be light intensity or temperature related. Um, something's going on. Uh, and another thing is there's, um, there's, a, there's a bit of a, a sort of... Uh, a kind of mini peak in April and, and again a drop in May as as getting lighter and as um, it's getting warmer in sort of May the, the the population of algae is going down so clearly there's a lot of things that are wrong with this conclusion and we don't know all sorts of things as well we don't know what's happening to the algae um, in December because it only goes from March to November so we don't know what's going on in December we don't know what's going on in January or February. There's three months missing. We've got no idea what's happening as well. So those are a lot of things that you could have said. Let's look at the mark scheme. <clears throat> here they are. There's four things that, that, uh, that you potentially could have said here. Zoom in a little bit. Uh, okay, so first of all, no data for winter months. December, January, Feb, not there. We don't have any information about temperature or light. We just have to, if, if you are making that Conclusion, you're really just assuming a lot of things. There are fluctuations or dips during the summer months, like that July drip drop, and the idea that there's some other factor. Other factor. Probably the most obvious other factor that's probably affecting it is varying nutrient levels. Maybe sometimes in the year you get nutrients running into the stream or whatever it is, which causes an algal bloom, and at other times of year there's less nutrients available on the water, which reduces the population of algae. Probably. Okay, let's uh, keep going. All right, so now we get into what this algae looks like. So it says many algal species are unicellular organisms. Some occur in colonies, and here's a typical algal cell. It says at various times, algae have been classified in different kingdoms. Using information given, given above, draw a conclusion about which kingdom is the most appropriate in which to classify algae. Okay, so what information have we been given? Or what information is there? Well, first thing is that they are unicellular organisms. That is key, and that's the thing that most people missed when they did this question. Uh, what else do they have? Well, they have, uh, they have membrane-bound organelles, such as chloroplasts and mitochondria. They have a nucleus. They have a cell wall. Okay, so let's look at these things. Let's talk about what each thing means. Well, nucleus is def definitely means eukaryote, right? If it didn't have a nucleus, it'd be a prokaryote. So the prokaryotes are out. Uh, cell wall, well, that could be uh, a plant or it could be a fungus. But maybe then you would notice that it says made of cellulose. Fungus would have a cell wall made of chitin. So therefore, fungus is out. Could be plant. Um, chloroplast, again, could be a plant. Uh, now, the thing that makes it actually not a plant, but a protist, is that it is a unicellular organism, okay? That's the reason. So most people said that it was a plant, um, but actually, it's a protist. Look at the mark scheme here. So, there's four marks available. One mark is for uh, protista or protoctista. Protist, protista or protoctista. Um, you get a mark for talking about the nucleus, so therefore eukaryotic. So most people got that mark. Um, you get a mark for saying um, because the cell because the cell wall is cellulose, it's not fungi. Uh, and you get a mark for saying because it's a cell wall, it's not an animal. But this is the thing that people missed. Okay, 
if you got this wrong, you just need to know that anything with a chloroplast that is only unicellular is a protist. Algae or protists, they are not plants. Plants are multicellular uh, by definition. Back to the question paper. So just one piece of evidence, not given above, that could be used to provide strong support for classification in a particular kingdom. Well, we need DNA evidence, really, don't we? Uh, just very quickly go to the Mart scheme there. Um, and that's, that's what it says. Okay, so uh, DNA, base sequence, uh, base sequence of DNA, genetic material, anything really like that. Um, and then we could compare that to other genetic material from other kingdoms and look at the similarities. <clears throat> right. On to question 22. And this is really, uh, again, a nasty question. Um, haven't seen a question like this for a while. Uh, it's an interesting one. And it's tough. So we've got a long list of structures. Some of them are cells, some of them, some of them are multiple cells, or even structures within cells, okay? So this is about categorizing things correctly. So it says here, which letter or letters indicate cells or structures, cells or structures, involved in preventing the entry of pathogens into the body? Preventing the entry, so let's go through. Antigen presenting cells, no, that's about once they're already in. Erythrocytes, no, those are red blood cells. Goblet cells, yes, okay, those are mucus producing cells. So they uh, provide, produce mucus, let's say in the nose, and that stops uh, viruses, bacteria gaining access into the body. So that's one. Lymphocytes, no, that's once things are already in the bloodstream. Lysosomes, no, that's a part of a cell, no. Mucous membranes, yeah, that's that's a tissue where you might find a goblet cell. Neutrophils, no, those are, you know, phagocytes. Phagosomes are, is a structure within a, within a phagocyte. It is the kind of enzyme-containing musical that digests something. Platelets, huh. I'm going to say yes, because a platelet is involved in a clotting response. So if it's involved in a blood clotting response, it could be uh, producing a scab, which would block entry of pathogens from a cut in the skin, yes. So we're looking for four letters, C, F, I, and J. Moving on to number two, which letter or letters indicate cells or structures that act as a physical barrier to entry of pathogens? So we've already looked at the these four things prevent entry of pathogens, but which ones would you say are the kind of physical barrier? Well, goblet cells aren't really the physical barrier. They produce mucus, so that's not the thing. F, a mucous membrane is a physical barrier, yeah. And uh, platelets aren't a physical barrier. The skin is a physical barrier, so F and J are the, the kind of the actual barriers. Um, C helps make F and I helps patch up J um, when it's cut. Which letter or letters indicate cells or structures that are involved in phagocytosis? Okay, phagocytosis, we've got quite a few here. Um, so first of all, we've got neutrophils. Neutrophils are the main phagocytotic cells. We've got phagosomes, so that's H. Those are the structures that do phagocytosis. Um, lysosomes, lysosomes are the structures that contain the enzymes. Those are also involved. And is there something else? I think there's something else, but I can't think. Is it A? Antigen, an antigen presenting cell does phagocytosis and then presents antigen. So is it G, E, H, E, and A? Let's have a look at the mark scheme. It's a really tricky one. Yeah, it is. A, E, G, and H. So here are the letters there. C, F, I, and J for the top one. I and J. And then A, E, and G, and H. You need all four for the mark. This is why it's such a horrendous question. Uh, you need all four for the mark. You need both of those for the mark. You need all four for the mark. It's really difficult, that. Um, the next one uh, is F. 
and it's one or a few types of cell performing a function. So this is asking you which one is a tissue, uh, <clears throat> and it's F, uh, or mucous membrane, because it is uh, a group of cells performing a particular function. So a tissue can sometimes have different cell types in it. The mucous membrane has both goblet cells and also ciliated epithelial cells, uh, and that meets the definition of a tissue. So this question is really quizzing you about your understanding of the tissue definition. That's 22 part four, uh, which is this one, which we just went through. Okay, let's keep going. Phagocytosis involves cytokines and opsonins. State the role of cytokines and opsonins in phagocytosis. So cytokines involve um, cell to cell communication. So they signal to cells to increase phagocytosis. Whereas opsonins bind to, um, bind to uh, uh, an antigen and flag it uh, for phagocytosis by, by the immune system. They're, they're like a, they actually bind to the white blood cell on the other end. So just a quick diagram of that. So like this is a bacteria and these are the antigens on the surface. I'm trying to do little triangles here. Uh, an opsonin is a sort of special type of antibody that attaches, binds like this, and it has a certain bit here which can actually interact with a large, uh, you know, macrophage or something like that, it has a specific receptor here that can attach to this. And then now that this has been flagged by this opsonin, the uh, macrophage uh, here or the neutrophil will phagocytose this here. Let's look at the mark scheme. So cytokines are a chemical signal and they attract the phagocytes. Now, in this, this is a tr tricky definition here. It says, to get this mark, you needed to have the idea of movement because it says, ignore increased phagocytosis without reference to movement. So it's kind of a chemical signal that's calling in more phagocytes. T helper cells might release cytokines if it was appropriate to signal uh, to phagocytes to kind of come to an area. Uh, and then opsonins, you need to have the idea of binding to is the key thing. Binding to either the pathogens or the antigens, uh, and increasing phagocytosis, something to, something about, or you could have said something about recognition by phagocytes. Okay, the last part of this um, question is all about types of immunity. So let's quickly run through the different types of immunity here. Natural active, that's you producing antibodies in your body after you've gained a natural infect after you've had a natural infection. <clears throat> natural and passive, well this is not producing uh, antibodies in the body because it's passively receiving antibodies and the only place that this happens naturally uh, is in breastfeeding babies. So babies breastfeed and they get antibodies in their mother's milk and that's a natural process where they're passively taking antibodies their mother has made and it's going into the baby's body. Artificial and active, well that's artificially making someone create antibodies. So that's an injection or vaccination. That's the artificial bit, but then you actively make the antibodies in your body. And then artificial and passive is injecting antibodies into someone, okay? So that is what's described in this question. People who have recently recovered from chickenpox can donate blood plasma, which has antibodies, and then this can be given to leukemia patients. So this would be, um, artificial and passive uh, and the reason artificial basically involves injection injections are not a natural thing and passive because um, the antibodies are not being made by the patient they're made uh, in someone else in the person who's just recovered from chickenpox let's look at the mark scheme uh, for that so we needed the word injected you can't just repeat natural or artificial or active or passive because they're already given in the question. And the, the passive is the idea the patient is not producing the antibodies themselves or doesn't have an immune response going on in their body themselves. Okay, so we're about halfway. Uh, if you wanna grab a quick cup of tea, uh, take a little break, that's a good time. Uh, and here we have now finished the first part of the paper 
which was questions selected from a biological diversity paper. So when we come back, we're going to look at the, the, set, the questions that were selected from a unified biology paper. There's a slightly different style of question and maybe slightly more challenging. Right, here we are back again. Uh, we're going to now charge through the unified biology questions, and I'm going to try and go faster because I realize this is video is taking a bit long. Um, so the first question here is about doing a drawing, a, a large, uh, unmagnified drawing, not of a, a slide, but of a kidney that's been cut. Okay, so it's about biological drawing. I'm going to go jump straight to the mark scheme in a second. Uh, but you basically want to just show a kind of plan of the kidney showing where the different tissues are. So that would look like this. That doesn't look great, does it, that drawing? But that actually gets you two marks. The reason this diagram down here gets you two marks is because we have clear continuous lines in this section and we have the correct labels over here. We've got the uh, cortex, the pelvis and the medulla all correctly labeled. Now I really want you to look at the do not allow bits because they're super picky. What do they not allow? They don't allow incomplete or overlapping lines or any sketchy lines. They don't allow any shading or cross hatching. They don't allow any blood vessels shown because they're not on, on the organ that you were given. And they do not allow it if label lines are incorrectly drawn, which means if they have arrowheads or if they're not straight. So biological drawings are the most pedantic thing about all of biology. Uh, you need to know what it is they're looking for. Back to the question paper. Right, here is a photomicrograph of a stained section of kidney tissue um, there. Uh, and we've got some various things going on. Okay, so distal convoluted tubule, this one here, what's the function of that? That is um, regulation of potassium. Iron concentration. Describe the function of structures labeled A. Right, now then you have to figure out what is A. So here's A, and it's in there. Let's zoom in uh, and get a real close-up look at what that is. You can sort of see that it, it looks a bit brushy in appearance, okay? So this is kind of a brushiness, and that is a... There's no brushiness there. That's going to be important later. So that brushiness is microvilli. So microvilli provide a greater surface area for reabsorption. Oh yeah. So you just... Okay, cool. So I will see you in 10 minutes? Yeah, All right. Okay, so slightly shorter, eight minutes. Yeah. All right, in a bit. Bye-bye. Oh, I'm still recording. Okay, so then the next uh, part is suggest which lumen B or C has the highest concentration of urea. Explain your answer. So B is the distal convoluted tubule and C is the proximal convoluted tubule. So here you need to kind of remember the kind of general layout of the nephron, which I'll kind of just draw sort of here. You've got the um, Bowman's capsule there and then you go into the PCT down the loop of Henley, then you've got the DCT, and then you've got the collecting duct, okay? So we're talking about really the movement of um, fluid after it's come out of the glomerulus, which is here. It goes down the PCT and glucose and amino acids and also water are reabsorbed down the loop of Henley where loads more water is reabsorbed, uh, and then it goes towards the collecting duct. So where's there more urea? Well, there's more urea after more water has been reabsorbed, so it's over here in the DCT, there is more urea. Let's just quickly double check what the mark scheme, or how the mark scheme kind of, um, what the mark scheme allows. Uh, the first point there is reabsorption and regulation of a named ion. Um, so I said K plus, so regulation of K potassium is fine, or you could have said these other ones as well. Uh, the microvilli is to increase the surface area for reabsorption. Uh, and the, the third third question there was B, and you have to give the explanation as well. It's B and because water is reabsorbed. Okay, water 
underlined. That means you can't get the mark unless you have the, 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 the word water. Water has been reabsorbed. Okay, uh, back to the question paper. Okay, now we come to another six marker. Uh, so let's first of all analyze the six marker, figure out what we need to do. It says water reabsorption in the kidney is controlled by the endocrine and nervous systems. Aldosterone and ADH are hormones that act on the kidney. And then it gives us some information about aldosterone. Aldosterone causes sodium ions to be pumped from the collecting duct cells into tissue fluid. Uh, and it says, describe how the endocrine and nervous systems work together to increase water reabsorption from the collecting duct. So I think that's probably the key instruction. Okay, this is the key instruction of the six marker. Describe how the endocrine and nervous systems work together. Now notice that the and is in bold. So you've got to talk about both. So I'm just going to do the plan for this and then we'll look at the mark scheme and you can um, kind of analyze your answers and where you went wrong. But we're going to need to talk about both. We're going to need to talk about the endocrine system. And we're going to need to talk about the nervous system. Uh, so, it may be, first of all, more obvious uh, how to sort of talk about one system rather than the other. So let's kind of jump in with the obvious stuff first. So ADH is a hormone, okay? So ADH uh, is a hormone. Um, it is released <clears throat> from the posterior pituitary or just the pituitary. It travels in the blood. Um, and it binds to receptors on the cells of the collecting duct. So the receptors, it looks like susceptors there, but that's supposed to be receptors. Receptors, uh, collecting duct. And then maybe some detail about how it works. We could talk about um, aquaporins, so vesicles. Uh, let me zoom on. Uh, vesicles, and then we could talk about aquaporins. Uh, and then more water reabsorbed. Okay, so that's pretty good stuff for the endocrine system. Uh, talking about ADH, we haven't actually talked about aldosterone at all there, so probably also want to talk about aldosterone. Uh, I'm just going to come do another little column over here, I'm just going to write it here. So aldosterone, also a hormone. What is it? And we have to use the information they've given us because aldosterone, the detail of aldosterone is not really in the syllabus, so you have to use this information sodium ions to be pumped from the collecting duct cells into tissue fluid surrounding the collecting duct. So aldosterone, again, hormone. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's produced in the adrenal gland. So that's another endocrine thing. And then explain how it works. So um, Na plus ions pumped. Um, and then you could talk about the water potential and H2O follows. So the idea that the sodium ions are pumped into the tissue fluid, causing a decrease in water potential, which would mean that water would then follow the sodium ions out of the lumen of the collecting duct, past the collecting duct cells and into the tissue fluid that surrounds the, uh, the collecting duct. So basically aldosterone would, in, would decrease the water potential in the tissue fluid around the collecting duct even more, and it's already pretty low because of the loop of Henle. So we've got loads on endocrine. What about the nervous? The nervous is a bit harder. Well, we need to think about how um, ADH is produced. Well, it all starts with osmoreceptors. Now, these osmoreceptors are in the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is in the brain. Okay, so the hypothalamus is in the brain, and that is part of the nervous system. It's the central nervous system. Um, and then those osmoreceptors actually, um, when they detect a, let me get this right, when they detect a low, yeah, when they detect a low water potential, um, an action potential is sent down the axon of the, uh, of the osmoreceptor to the ends of, of the osmoreceptor cells, and those are in the posterior pituitary. Posterior pituitary. Uh, and it's the, it's the sort of ends of the axon um, it's almost a bit like a synapse. So the, 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 the message, the action potential is sent down the axon when it reaches the end of the axon. Instead of the synapse releasing neurotransmitter, you kind of have a sort of modified synapse 
that releases um, ADH, and that's released into the blood. So that's all the nervous system, osmoreceptors, hypothalamus, brain, action potential, uh, you could say vesicles containing ADH, I guess. So that's part of the nervous system. Okay, so we've got endocrine, we've got nervous system, we need to talk about both things. And if we can, that's a lot of information. Look how many points we've got there, probably one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like 15 points or something. And if you were to do that, you would definitely get six marks. Okay, so let's see the mark scheme uh, and how the this how this question was graded. Okay, first important thing is to look at this kind of the level description. So level one and two, let's start with here. Describes how the nervous system or endocrine system enables water reabsorption uh, or outlines the roles of both systems in water reabsorption. So there's, there's, an, there's or here. So, so I guess this is either talking about Basically, I, one or the other, basically. Two, level two, three or four marks, you have to say and. You have to have both uh, systems. You have to talk about both systems. Describes how the nervous system and endocrine system enable water reabsor uh, reabsorption. So if you didn't talk about both, um, then basically you can only get two marks, which is uh, a bit of a bummer. Level, uh, level three, five or six marks, this is what we're going for, obviously, describes with some detail the roles of the nervous and endocrine systems in enabling water reabsorption. It is likely that the role of more than one hormone is included. So basically for the five or six, you, you, it's not essential, but you kind of need to talk about, about both, both ADH and aldosterone on the endocrine side, and you also need to talk about the nervous side. So on the right here, uh, it's kind of broken down into the to sort of three parts. We've got the endocrine system here, the nervous system here, and aldosterone, which is part of the endocrine system. Okay, so to get <clears throat> to get one or two, you're kind of talking about one of these things. Uh, to get three or four, you want to talk about this and this, and probably to get five or six, you need to talk about all three. Okay, uh, but potentially you could have got five with um, uh, a lot of detail about both of these, but you didn't mention aldosterone. Um, and uh, I'm always picky when I want these. I don't think I'm, I'm not sure if I gave six unless you were very specific saying this is part of the nervous system and this is part of the endocrine system. I really want you to get in the habit of tailoring your answer to exactly what the question is asking you. So not just telling, not just saying the information you know, but looking at what the question is asking you. How is it endocrine and, and um, nervous and saying it very clearly. Okay, so pause the video here, have a look at this mark scheme, figure out why you got the mark you did, uh, and see what you would do differently next time. Okay, let's move on. Okay, a follow-up question, still on this idea of kidneys. Um, it's about diuretics. Again, we've got a table of information here. It gives us a little bit of information uh, at the start, a little sort of uh, preamble. It says diuretics are drugs that decrease the reabsorption of water into the blood from the kidney. So that means if there's less reabsorption of water, you're going to produce more urine. Okay. So diuretics make you wee more. Uh, they can also change the concentration of ions and other molecules in the blood. And some diuretics are used to treat high blood pressure. Here's, here we've got X, Y, and Z and some of their effects. So probably always a good idea. Just look at the, the uh, kind of the rows uh, first, just to kind of get an idea. So look at this rate of urine production. Um, so they all increase, but look at Y here. That increases loads. So that's something to pick out. Chloride ion concentration of the blood. Okay, well, that's the normal. That seems to drop it. Uh, and both those seem to increase it. Interesting, okay, so I'll just maybe mark that. So that's down, that's up, that's up. Potassium ion concentration, that doesn't seem to have much of effect. That increases it quite a lot, and that increases it a bit. Blood glucose concentration, no effect. Increases, increases. <clears throat> All right, 
suggests which the diuretics, X, Y, or Z, would be the most effective at reducing a person's blood pressure. So blood pressure is, well, if you have a lot of blood, then it's under high pressure. Uh, and you can reduce blood pressure by reducing the volume of blood. So the diuretic that would be most effective uh, for this would be Y. Okay, Y, more urine, produced. Suggest which of the diuretics, X, Y, or Z, would be the most appropriate for use uh, by a person with type 2 diabetes. Well, diabetes is to do with having uh, elevated blood sugar or not being able to control your blood sugar. So um, the, the best one here would be X because blood sugar isn't affected. Whereas per, if you use Y or Z, blood sugar would be elevated even more uh, than normal, which you don't want because diabetics either have a problem with production of insulin or with kind of responding to insulin. So their blood sugar tends to be has, a, has a, a chance of going too high. So uh, doesn't so the answer X and the reason doesn't affect blood glucose level. Quick look at the mark scheme so you can see exactly what the exam uh, examiners are accepting or not. <clears throat> so we've got the top two there. You need both the letter and the reason for the mark. So the, the first one was Y and the idea of reduces blood volume the most. I'm not actually sure if I would have got that. Oh yeah, I would have done, so yeah. I didn't. I didn't specifically say it when I when I when I mentioned it. But more urine is produced is allowed. I think, e.g., more urine is produced is fine. Um, but maybe I could. Maybe if I was saying that, I could say more clearly. More urine is produced, therefore the blood volume would be reduced. Would be the best answer. Uh, and then X here does not raise blood glucose. Okay, you have to use the word glucose there. Look, it's underlined. So if you said sugar, I think that probably would not be accepted. It has to be glucose. Moving on. <clears throat> All right. Vowels of the heart. Uh, you've got to know these vowels of the heart. They're very important. Um, and I think what I'll do is I will just drop in um, a little animation of uh, the heart moving here. So you can kind of see it on the right hand side as I'm talking. So let's uh, go through them now. OK, let's highlight them first of all and we'll start with this one down here the the left side so um, so the left side of the heart remember is this side here I'll, I'll highlight it uh, sort of all of it uh, this color because it's containing oxygenated blood um, so this valve here between the left atrium which is there and the left ventricle, which is there, that is called the left atrioventricular valve. Left atrioventricular. It is also the bicuspid, but you don't need to know that word for your syllabus, bicuspid. So there it is, uh, right here. Uh, how can I highlight it again? I'm just going to sort of mark it here this this one right here between the left atrium and left ventricle that is the left atrial ventricle or bicuspid right now the other side uh the other side the right side of the heart remember is on this part of the diagram okay um and it's carrying deoxygenated blood which has come from the body so if we label the heart here we've got the right atrium we've got the right ventricle and also we've got this blood vessel uh, I should have highlighted this as well. So uh, this blood vessel here, as blood exits the right ventricle and comes out, it goes into this, which is the pulmonary artery. And then that splits and one goes off to the left lung and one goes off to the right lung like that. So the source of blood for the right semilunar valve, which uh, I'll sort of put it here in kind of green, is that one. The source of the blood is the uh, right ventricle. And the destination of the blood ventricle is the pulmonary artery or arteries. OK, uh, and let's have a quick look at the mark scheme. Just to double check. 
There it is. Right ventricle, pulmonary arteries. It says ignore lungs. Uh, that's that's not enough detail. Uh, left atrioventricular, or you could have said bicuspid. All right, moving on. All right, moving on to this next part of the question. This says, describe and explain why people with VSD can easily become uh, tired. So VSD is this uh, ventricular septal defect, basically a hole in the heart. I actually know uh, two people who have this condition. Um, doesn't affect them hugely, but they can become tired. So what's the reason? Well, I think I probably, I'm not sure if I would get full marks for this if I haven't looked at the mark scheme already, because I'd probably just say that the blood can mix. Now you can get marks for that. Uh, if you look through this hole, you know, we can have mixing of blood going sort of backwards and forwards, but we could be more specific. We could uh, be more detailed. So um, during... Um, so when the um, when the ventricles are contracting, we'd, we'd expect um, basically blood to be moving out of the left ventricle and uh, some of it would be going up out into, out of the aorta. I'll draw that in here. Uh, I'll just draw it in red, sort of up or out like this. But some of it would actually move back in here. OK, so we get a sort of mixing and this would be kind of become partially uh, kind of partially oxygenated. Um, which would mean that the, then the blood, when it went off to the lungs, wouldn't be able to absorb as much oxygen because it already have some oxygen in it. Um, uh, and therefore, the sort of concentration gradient would be, wouldn't be big enough. And then we'd have not as much oxygen getting to the body. So that's the, that's the main idea. Um, but I probably would have just said blood mixing here. Um, would any deoxygenated blood go from the right ventricle into the left ventricle? I don't think that much because this would be under lower pressure the right ventricle beats the uh, contracts with a lower pressure than the left ventricle. Um, however, potentially, I suppose during the atrial contraction, maybe some blood would go through when the ventricles were contracting, the atria might sort of push through this way. Uh, anyway, uh, let's move on. I'll show you the mark scheme once I get to the end of this page. Creatine kinase is an enzyme that catalyzes reaction in heart muscle. High levels of CK in the blood indicate the person may have had a heart attack. Now, this was a question which was done not brilliantly because uh, it was actually kind of a tricking you. It was really asking you about intracellular versus extracellular enzymes because this question says that creatine kinase is present in heart muscle. So that's in the cells of heart muscle. Uh, but if it's in the blood, it's it has somehow managed to get out of the cells. So probably the cells have been damaged in some way to release this intracellular enzyme into the blood. Um, and a lot of blood tests kind of look for enzymes that shouldn't be in the blood. Um, you know, if, like you might have liver enzymes in the blood, sign of liver damage. Heart enzymes in the blood, sign of heart damage, and so on. D, mice often used in laboratory studies to research treatments for heart conditions. These mice are often clones. Why are clones used in these studies? Well, keywords here that you should have maybe seen or sort of jumped out at you, lab studies, clones. Why do we use clones in lab studies? Well, if we're using clones, then we can be sure that all of the uh, mice in this case in the study are genetically identical. So there's no genetic variation. So we can kind of, any differences in results between different groups are not down to genetics. So it just it's a control variable basically. Right, let's look at the mark scheme for those three questions. And it's right here. So this is what I was trying to get at with the with the detail which they've they kind of got for that first question. So um, you do get a mark for saying oxygenated and deoxygenated blood mix. Um, but they've gone into a bit more detail. They've said blood leaks from the left to right ventricle, it's because it's going down from high pressure to left to lower pressure from the left to the right side um, and then then this is going on about the fact that oxygenated blood is delivered to the lungs and some deoxygenated pass some deoxygenated blood passes into left ventricle and that's during atrial systole so basically the end result is that less oxygen less oxygenated blood pumped around the body less oxygen available for respiration you have to either say in this last mark for respiration or for atp production then this, this uh, mark, the marks here are basically for intracellular enzymes or alternative wording or the enzymes, maybe you could have said 
the enzyme um, would normally only be found within the muscle cells, like this, creating carnage, should be within the cells. Uh, damage to the heart, so only one mark for this, but could be the same thing. And then down here, the idea that no genetic variation to affect the results. Pause there if you need to look at the mark scheme in more detail, and move on. Okay, uh, ecologists were studying an area that contained three different habitats. The area is shown in the diagram below. Ecologists sampled the area to estimate insect biodiversity. Describe how the ecologists should choose the number and location of their samples to ensure that the sampling is representative. So this is, the main thing here is this, how they should choose the number and location of their samples. Now that's a big clue actually. Um, so it, it's not, it's not, it's unlikely to be just like a random number generator across the whole area. How, how many samples and what locations? So this is getting at stratified sampling. Now stratified sampling is where an area is clearly broken down into sort of separate uh, kind of components. So we've got peat bog 800, farmland 800 and grassland 400. So that means when we're sampling the insect biodiversity, we shouldn't just, um, we should make sure that the number of samples we do is representative uh, and is in the same ratio as the area of each sort of um, habitat that we're sampling. So that means we should do a, a sort of sampling ratio of two to two to one. Okay, so if, if we were, five samples would not be sufficient. You know, two, two and one, that's not enough. But if we were doing 100 samples, um, then we could do 40, 40, and 20, for example, that would work. Um, it, says, it also says use a calculation to support your answer. So if, when we're using a calculation, what do we do? Well, let's say total area equals 800 plus 800 plus 400, which is equal to 2,000 meters squared. Um, and then we should basically maybe do some sort of calculation like this. So 800 divided by 2,000, 800 divided by 2,000, and 400 divided by 2,000. And that will give us a, a sort of the, a fraction, and it works out that this is uh, 40%, this is 40%, and this is 20% of the area. So however many samples we do, 40%, you, you, get, you get what I'm saying. Um, and then you get some marks for talking about how you would actually do the sampling. <clears throat> Let's look at the mark scheme here. Um, now most people actually, quite a lot of people got that uh, idea of the maths, but they didn't know what it was called. Stratified sampling. That's what it is, stratified sampling. Um, and then the detail uh, of the stratified sampling, um, which is that the number of samples in each sector is proportional to the area. Um, and then the calculation, or actually just giving proportional, num propor proportional numbers. Uh, the next question was, I've never seen one like this at all, actually, the next question. This is just maths, really, okay? Uh, it's using, doing population maths. I suppose the one thing that might have been a little, one thing that was a bit difficult here was just making sure you knew what these, all these letters stood for. Um, and the other thing was just show, you know, make sure you're doing your working sort of um, on the page. Don't try and do it in your head um, or in your calculator. Also, I would really advise not doing that. Do it on the page and you can, Go step by step and, and you won't go wrong. So the population size is n1 times n2 divided by m. So n is the number of indiv individuals in a particular sample. So n1 is sample 1. So let's just label that here, make it really clear. n1, uh, n2 is sample 2, and m is the number of marked individuals. Okay, so this is n1, n2, and, and m. <coughs> so if we do the large heath uh, butterfly, uh, it's going to be 77 uh, times 73. I actually write it out here. Times 73 and divided by m, which is 4. Okay, so you do this 77 plus 73 
and then you did, oops, sorry, that's the times. I almost went wrong there. 77 times 73, and then you divide it by four. That will give us uh, our estimate there. For the Chapman estimate, it's a bit more difficult. So you have to add one to each thing. Uh, but yeah, you basically add one to everything. So it would be 78 plus, again, times 74, and over n plus one, which is five and then work it all out. I'm just going to give you the answers here. I'm going to go through how you work it all out. Um, but you have to round to the nearest number. So you might have um, put it wrong there. You have one mark for the top row and one mark for the bottom row, basically. 1405 and 1153, 30 and 20. Um, someone actually, I think someone even rounded it, uh, like rounded it the wrong way. I think they rounded it down or something when they should have rounded it up. It has to be still to the nearest whole number. And for this, this was a strange question. You basically just have to say that they, they, um, that they give, um, I can't remember which one gives a bigger number that's in the mark scheme. I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but one of them gives a bigger number. Chapman, Lincoln gives a higher number or, or Chapman gives a lower number. Uh, and then this was, this, this was a difficult point to get. The idea that proportionately, that difference would be would be larger for smaller populations. So for very large populations and the hundreds of thousands of individuals, they're probably pretty pretty similar. These both these different formulas for estimation. But if you if the population is like twenty animals or something, then uh, the, then the, the differences could be quite significant. Pause there if you need to. All right, next one. Okay, this question is all about preservation versus conservation. Okay, preservation versus conservation. So um, preservation is when you completely sort of fence off an area and you just leave it. Uh, so no one goes in, there's no active management. It's just if you keep humans out and let it be, it'll be preserved in its natural state. Whereas conservation... Um, allows for more active management. So if you're, if an area is conserved, then it might be human intervention to sort of actively manage and protect or sustain the ecosystem. So what bits are kind of preservation and what bits are not? Let's highlight, so I'll highlight green for the bits in here that are preservation. Um, buffer region was created. So no visitors were allowed. That is a preservation type thing, not allowing anyone there. Mm, and this peat extraction, tree planting, and the use of fertilizers were banned. That's a preservation thing. But what about conservation? Uh, I'll sort of highlight, I'll highlight yellow for conservation, which is active management. So the ditches were blocked to raise water levels. There is some management going on there. Um, and the fact that it had already been damaged, okay, so the habitat had already been damaged by peat extraction. So it's not really in its natural state anyway. So that implies conservation. So there's some things that support the conclusion and some things that don't support the conclusion, which is quite, which is typical for these student conclusion type questions. Typically, you've got to give a bit of for and a bit of against. <coughs> D, conservation agreements can be national within a particular country or international. This is really just about knowing your laws. And I'm going to show you the marks for both questions once we've gone through this one. So the environmental countryside stewardship, stewardship scheme is a UK thing. And, you know, it's basically paying farmers. This is what it is. CITES is an international agreement. It means you can't, like, ship elephant ivory from Tanzania to, uh, you know, the United Kingdom. It's an international agreement and it doesn't pay farmers. It's just it aims to stop poaching and, and killing of wildlife. And the Rio Convention on Biological Diversity, again, is an international agreement. Um, where governments have signed up to sort of say that they will do something to protect biodiversity. Okay, let's look at the mark scheme for those two. Here it is. Uh, the first one, we've kind of gone through it already. So preservation because, no visitors allowed, uh, etc. But not preservation because the habitat is being managed and it's already been changed. Notice it says, do not allow no human interference because... 
there is some the ditches are you know uh, managed pause if you need and that next one is is there that's just the uh, the marks where i've made uh, all correct two marks one or two rows correct gives you one mark <coughs> All right, moving on to this one. Okay. The oxygen dissociation curve for adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin are shown. Uh, I will just, I think, very quickly uh, color those. Let's do adult as pink. Makes it jump out more. Uh, from the page, and I like color. Okay, adult and fetal. Outline why it's important that fetal hemoglobin has a higher oxygen affinity than adult hemoglobin. Well, the reason is fetal hemoglobin has to have a higher affinity because it has to um, take oxygen um, from adult hemoglobin. When, they, when they're both um, in the placenta, when adult hemoglobin and fetal hemoglobin are both moving next to each other in the placenta, separated by a very thin membrane, um, adult hemoglobin will release oxygen and fetal hemoglobin with a higher affinity binds to that oxygen. If it didn't, then the fetus would not get any oxygen. So what do we need to say for the two marks? You have to use the word placenta um, if you, if, to get this first mark. The fact that there's low oxygen concentration in the placenta. I think you probably would get it if you said there's a low, the placenta is a low oxygen environment. I think that would probably do it. Um, but really, we want concentration. And even better, get used to saying this. Whenever, you're whenever we're talking about hemoglobin dissociation curves, talk about partial pressure, or just P, the small p, PO2. It's, the, it's a biological me measure of like gas concentration, basically. Um, this this uh, thing people got, well, the idea of O2 transfer, but you had to have the word hemoglobin at least once. So not just oxygen is passed from the mother to baby. That would not be good enough but from, from adult hemoglobin to fetal hemoglobin. Um, right, on to the next one. All right, this question is um, basically drawing a graph from this text. So you have to kind of extract the key information from the text and turn it into a graph. It's got a weird question, interesting. Uh, I hadn't seen this sort of thing before. So when oxygen first becomes available, myoglobin saturation increases at a constant rate of 8%. So in the this means straight line, okay? Straight line at the beginning. And this gives you the gradient actually. It's a gradient of 8% per little square. So let's look at that. Where would how would we draw that? So with what you know one little square one, two, three, four, five. Uh, so one little square would be at eight. Actually that would be like there. Two little squares will be at 16, three little squares will be at 24, and so on. Uh, but that's actually kind of difficult to do. I would probably go for this. This is 10. So 10 is going to be at 80. If it goes up 8% per 1, by 10, it's going to be at 80. Um, and if it was at 5, which is actually here, it would be at 40. So that's the gradient. I'll try and draw that uh, sort of like that. It's supposed to be a straight line, okay? So you should draw that with a ruler. Uh, that's the first part of the graph. You get a mark for that, I think. Um, then it says it kind of um, <clears throat> the rate of oxygen binding slows gradually until the myoglobin is 100% saturated. And then it says when does it get to 100% saturated? Uh, sorry, I need to annotate here. Slows gradually. So this means curve. Oh, what the hell? So this means a curve. And then down here. It reaches 100% saturation is the partial pressure at which adult hemoglobin is 80% saturated. Okay, so what does that mean? So where is adult hemoglobin 80% saturated? Adult hemoglobin is this pink one and it's 80% saturated there. Okay, so there's the 80%. So that means that at this point, it's going to be 100% saturated. So basically, it just so I can see it curves like that. Something like that, okay? Uh, tricky question. Marks are one for the initial straight line and two for the curved line, which reaches 
at 52 nmHg. Next question. Oh, it's down this one. Next question here, hemocyanin is in lobsters and invertebrates. We can see that it has a higher affinity. It binds oxygen much more tightly at any oxygen partial pressure com uh, compared to hemoglobin. So therefore, we would think that these, these lobsters must be living in a uh, low oxygen environment so that their, their pigment can bind it tightly and, and sort of get it out of the low oxygen water that the lobster is living in and, and pass it around the body. So it's, it's the idea of a low oxygen environment is what you need to get for this mark. C, and that's the last question of this part of the paper. When old red blood cells are broken down, each heme group is converted to a molecule called bilirubin. Bilirubin passes through the digestive system and gives feces their characteristic color. Um, this is really just a question about what is the, pretty much asking you what is the definition of excretion, but in a weird way. So excretion is when a metabolic waste product is removed from the body. If you say those two things, and you get the two marks. Bilirubin is a metabolic waste product. It's been in cells, it's been part of the body's metabolism, and it's removed from the body uh, through feces. Double check the mark scheme to see what was allowed. That's pretty much what I said. So metabolic waste product and removed. Okay, stay with me. We're almost there. Uh, we're just on to these extra questions I had to add in to make it up to 100 marks. Um, <clears throat> so, this first one, a uh, great question, paper a couple years back, graph of antibody response, very relevant to what we're hearing in the news all the time at the moment. So, a lot of people missed this key point. It says, on day 30, on day 30, this individual was again infected. So a lot of people just went straight to this and kind of took the graph from here and went boom, like this, they went, whoa, like that. But no, it was on day 30 that they were affected, infected again. So the antibody concentration has to remain flat until at least day 30, and really probably like 31 or something, okay? And then it's gonna go up again, and it's gonna come down more slowly, and it probably is gonna stay elevated, uh, at least for a while. This is why we have a booster dose of the vaccine, for example. Um, so, and then, so you get two marks for, for kind of that. Uh, I'll show you the mark scheme in just a second so you can see exactly if you've got one mark, why, uh, and not two. And then it says, explain how memory cells cause the difference between the two lines in the graph. Now, obviously the question says memory cells already, so you can't just say like, memory cells do it, like you've got to get more information. So the idea is that this is called the primary response, and this is the secondary response. So in the primary response, uh, the production of antibodies requires clonal selection of B, B lymphocytes uh, and the clonal expansion of those B lymphocytes and their differentiating, differentiation into plasma cells that produce antibodies. So there's processes that need to happen, and it takes a while. Whereas in the second and secondary response, memory cells are already circulating in the blood. And once they um, encounter the pathogen again, they rapidly divide, multiply, and rapidly turn to plasma cells that produce antibodies a lot faster. Okay, mark scheme for that is right here. So the first thing uh, for the graph, you have to have one mark is for a higher peak and steeper initial rise. Gosh, did I even do that? Yeah, it should be a steeper initial rise. Uh, it says, do not allow if actually vertical. That would be kind of ridiculous. Um, and then it says the second mark, you have to have two things. The line leaves the x-axis somewhere between days 30 and 33. And the concentration at 60 days is above the peak of the printed line one. Let's look at that. So it has to be at least above this point at 60 days. It's got to be above here somewhere. Uh, mark scheme. And then this was the memory cells thing. Memory cells are not acting or present in the first primary response. They remain in the blood. So uh, not acting in primary response. They remain in the blood. And so they there's no wait for all this faster clonal selection, expansion, etc. <clears throat> right. 
Right, this, this is just a mean and a surprising number of people got this wrong, including me when I did it. I, took, I kept typing up my calculator and kept on getting it wrong and I really had no idea why I was doing it. And then I realized. So calculate the mean number of confirmed measles cases between 1997 and 1999. So this is up here, 97 to 99. It's these three numbers that we need to do. So we need to do 177 plus 56 plus 92 Add them all up and then divide by three. Uh, and some of you got it wrong, uh, I think got it wrong. And I would highly, highly recommend you do it like this, like, like I'm gonna do on my calculator. Do 177 plus 56 plus 92. And then you press equals to get the sum, which is 325. And then you divide by three. And then you get 108.3. Um, if you do it, Another way, there is a danger, if you're not paying attention, that you will actually do 177 plus 56, and then you do plus 92 divided by 3, or like plus 30 odd, and then you'll get the wrong number. Some people got it wrong because when they typed it in their calculator, they typed in 117. I did this like a good few times by mistake. I don't know why, and my brain was just like wanting to press 117 instead of 177. It was easy to do. Um, and then the percentage change, I think I'll just show you that, is 28. Now I think, yeah, you can get e ECF for this. So if you had messed up your average, you, you might have got the percentage change mark anyway, but it was 28. Remember the percentage change is the change divided by the starting value times 100 to make a percent. This is a good one. In early 2006, a newspaper claimed that the drop in MMR vaccination rates had not led to a predicted increase in measles cases. Let's go back to this. We have to evaluate the claim. When was it again? Early 2006. All right, so in early 2006, they hadn't got the 2006 numbers yet. They've only got the 2006, they've only got the 2005 numbers, really. So let's say January 20, 20 2006. Okay, people are saying, well, uh, look, look at what's happened over the last um, few years. We've gone from, you know, 90% vaccinated back in 97, and we've dropped all the way down to 80, 81%, okay? So we've had a big reduction. And look at the cases. The cases have, you know, dropped from 177 back in 1997 to 78. The cases are really low. So in that regard, sure, fine. However, it's not really valid because they haven't, uh, they've only, they've just picked one year, which looks good. But actually, if they'd done more of an average, they'd see that actually in 2002 and 2003, the numbers are really high, the highest they had been uh, over the last decade. And in 2004, they were pretty high as well, 188. So this, this concept of picking one year that supports your claim is called cherry picking. Um, Whereas if we look at the data more sort of broadly, it doesn't support the claim. So that's here. So the idea that the lowest year has been cherry picked, the idea that an average would be would be a better indicator, and that the levels have actually fluctuated. And then if you you could have used process data. So I think this is this is a three marker, so you needed to use process data. Does it say that in the question? Sometimes there's a bit of a clue. It does say use process data, okay? When it says use process data, that means that you can't just quote the data, you've got to do something with it. So what? Uh, you could do a percentage change, you could do uh, a mean or an average, uh, or I suppose you could do a difference. It has dropped by this amount. amount. But you've got to do some maths with it. You've got to process the data. So that's what process data means. Right, we're almost there. Last two, very simple, multiple choice. Neutrophil, that's a white blood cell. It is roughly a sphere, roughly. So therefore, the volume is D, four thirds pi r cubed for the volume of a sphere. Got to know that. Finally, for a student makes an unknown substance with water and ethanol, and a white suspension formed in the tube. This is a lipid test. So that's that. 
Right, uh, we've reached the end of that. Uh, I hope you found that useful. Uh, do please remember, hopefully you've done it maybe as you as you did the paper, that you need to do your evaluation sheet uh, and this all needs to be uploaded to OneNote. Thanks very much for listening and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.